Hello friends, welcome to the second episode of our discussion on figures of speech and in an earlier episode we discussed 10 of the most prominent figures of speech in use in English literature and today we shall discuss four. The four figures that we will discuss today are metonymy, synecdoche, hyperlarge or transferred epithet and chiasmus. We will begin with metonymy first. Now when we come to metonymy, we are reminded immediately that all metonymy consists of some form of a substitution of the name of one thing for another thing related to it. In other words, it is the substitution for the thing named for the thing meant. There are seven different ways in which such substitution occurs in literature and to aid memory and remembering, I ask my students to remember the word miscape, M I S C A P E, where each letter shall remind us of one particular type of metonym. Now we will begin with the letter M of miscape, which will remind us of the substitution of the maker for his work, M for maker, maker for his work or place for its production. For example, when we say we read Shakespeare, we mean we read the works of Shakespeare and as such we are naming the maker for his work. Again when we say all Arabia breathes from yonder box, a line from Alexander Pope, we imply the perfumes made in Arabia and not the country as such thereby substituting the product for the place of production. So this handles the M part of miscape, the first metonymy. The second letter I implies substitution of instrument or organ for the agent like the pen is mightier than the sword implying that a writer who uses a pen has a greater effective power than a soldier who wields the sword. Right? So again it is an instrument like a pen or a sword for the agent, for the person who uses such instrument. The next letter is S. S denotes the use of symbol or sign for the thing symbolized. Very easy to detect since examples would include he ascended the throne implying that he has become the king because the throne is a symbol of royalty or kingship. The next letter C of miscape implies the use of container for the thing contained. C for container, container for the thing contained. For example, when we say he drank the poisoned cup, we mean that he drank the contents of the cup which was poisonous and not the cup as such, right? because we obviously cannot drink a cup. Again when we say the whole auditorium laughed, we mean that the audience in the auditorium laughed since it is very clear that no auditoriums in themselves can laugh loud. right? So this is all about C of miscape. The next part is A which is what? Which is A for act for the object of the act. Like the principles of liberty was the scoff of every grinning courtier. And here the word scoff S C O double -F, F actually implies an object of ridicule. So clearly there is some form of a substitution of one thing for the other under the category act for the object of the act. The letter P in miscape is a memory aid for passion for the object or individual inspiring it. This consists in the use of a passion for an object or an individual like 
Gandhiji is the pride of India. Very clearly here the individual is named as the source of emotion and inspiration of pride among Indians through this substitution. And we have many of such types if you look around in our literature. The final letter E implies a substitution of effect for the cause or cause for the effect. Remember E for effect for the cause or the vice versa, cause for the effect. For example, in the sentence, the grey hairs were given responsibility of guidance. We imply that the old or experienced people who incidentally develop grey hairs were given the responsibility of guiding others. Again when we say he was the joy of the family, we actually imply that he was the cause of joy for the family and not joy of the family per se, he was the cause of the joy. Right? So this handles our metonymy and we now move on to synecdoche. Well, how do we define a synecdoche? It can be defined in various ways, but usually an operative definition of a synecdoche would be, well, it is in the use of a more comprehensive term instead of a less comprehensive term or vice versa. So, here also we have some form of a substitution, but there is a way in which we can differentiate metonymy and synecdoche very easily, which I will be pointing out at the end of this talk. Now, what does a synecdoche therefore imply? A synecdoche implies the same substitution, but here the scope of the substitution is something more comprehensive substituted by something less comprehensive or vice versa. Right? Here too, like metonymy, we have an aid to memory so that we can clearly identify under which category a particular sentence falls if it happens to be a synecdoche. And what is it? The word is sapim, S A P I M, where each of the letters S, A, and P represent two types of synecdoche each, and as we shall soon see. And the letters I and M at the end represent one type each. So, there is a total of 8 types or subdivisions of synecdoche commonly used in literature. Now, we begin with the first letter S of Sapin. Now, the letter S indicates a substitution of what type? Species for the genus or genus for the species. Species for the genus or genus for the species. So, species is something that is contained within genus which is a bit more comprehensive and examples we unknowingly use many examples under this category like silver and gold have I none. Here I do not imply that I do not have only silver or gold what I actually imply is that I do not have money and again in the sentence man shall not live by bread alone. The word bread indicates food in general and not specifically bread in particular. <coughs> so, clearly this is an example of the first category of metonymy, but there is the reverse as well. Species for the genus, now we come to examples of genus for the species like there is a notice since vessel is under maintenance there shall be no ferry service today. Since vessel is under maintenance, there shall be no ferry service today. Here the word vessel specifically means the ship that is used to ply passengers across the river. It is not any and every other vessel. So, clearly a more, much, much more comprehensive term vessel is used to specifically denote a less comprehensive term species which is a ship meant to ferry passengers across the river. Now, the second category of synecdoche under the memory letter A denotes abstract for the concrete and concrete for the abstract. 
For example, in the sentence, I am out of humanity's reach, the writer implies that he is out of the reach of any and every man. And again for the reverse, concrete for the abstract, we can cite the example, the father in the judge forgave the boy criminal. I repeat, the father in the judge forgave the boy criminal, implying that the fatherly feelings in the judge inspired him to be merciful to the boy criminal. Right? Now, the third category of synecdoche is represented as we know by the letter P of Sepim. Now, P denotes the synecdoche part for the whole and whole for the part. Right? So, we remember P equivalent to part for the whole and whole for the part. For example, in the sentence, an old man of 80 winters, we indicate or understand a man who is 80 years old and not a man who is only 80 literally winters old. Right? Why? Because every year has one winter. So, if it is 80 winters, the implication is he has lived for 80 years. Right? Now, the reverse of it, the whole for the part. For example, in the sentence, the falling year brought in freezing cold. The writer implies that the season of winter is actually what is in his mind and instead uses the whole year to replace a part of it, that is the winter season. Now, the next letter in that memory word sapim is I. What is it? I here would imply an individual for the class. An example would make this clear. In the sentence from Shakespeare, a Daniel is come to judgment. The individual Daniel is representative of any good judge. And again in the sentence, some mute inglorious Milton here may rest. Milton is not the literal persona John Milton, but here Milton is representative of any poet who may be lying buried in the tomb referred to by the speaker. Now, the final letter M in this memory word denotes material for the thing made. For example, in the sentence, he is dressed in silk. The speaker implies that he is wearing clothes made of silk. Therefore, there is a substitution of one thing for the other. Now, so far as the distinction between metonymy and synecdoche is concerned, most students tend to get confused as to whether a substitution sentence is a metonymy or a synecdoche because very often such, sub, such substitutions appear fairly identical to one another and under examination situations we do find students confusing one and wrongly picking up the, the uh, figure of speech that is asked. But I will uh, tell you that if there is a situation where a sentence is confusing you with regard to whether it is a metonymy or a synecdoche. Keep in mind that in all cases of synecdoche, the two things of substitution are identical and they are practically inseparable, they are not separable. Whereas in metonymy, the two things which are involved in substitution they are different from one another and in many cases they are so very different that connection is often sought to be made through thought process alone. <coughs> so, in a metonymy the connection between the two elements involved in substitution they are not very very obviously correlated as in the case of synecdoche. So, I repeat if you get the two elements of substitution where 
one is practically identical and inseparable from the other, identify that as a synecdoche. And in all other cases, where the substitution appears to be a bit more far fetched because you have to use a lot of thought to establish a connection or generate a meaning that would be a metonymy. Right? Now, if you go back to the examples that I have cited with regard to metonymy and synecdoche, you will be finding that this formula holds good for all of them. Right? Now, we go to our next figure of speech which is what which is hyperlarge or transferred epithet. Now, well as the name suggests transferred epithet consists in the practice of an adjective or a descriptive word which properly belongs to one thing being transferred to another thing associated with it. And very often it consists in the transferring of an adjective from a person or a living entity to the thing associated with that person or entity. For example, in the sentence, the ploughman homeward plods his very way. It is very clear that the way cannot be weary or tired. It is the ploughman who is tired. So, the weariness or tiredness of the farmer is transferred from the farmer to his path for greater poetic effect. Or for example, another sentence, three sleepless nights I have passed. Here clearly the adjective of sleeplessness is transferred from the person to the night for the same reason of poetic effect. Now our final figure of speech under discussion today is what is known as the chiasmus, which is rather easily detectable because it consists in the inversion of the words or phrases when they are repeated or subsequently referred to in the sentence. For example, in the Keatsian line, beauty is truth, truth beauty, we see an inversion of the word arrangement qualifying the whole figure as a chiasmus. Again in, in, in Shelley, we have the lines and singing still does soar and soaring ever singest. We clearly detect an inversion of phrases to heighten the combined effect of the flying and the singing of the bird. So, these are the four figures of speech which had to be discussed today. I hope I have been able to give you a bird's eye view of the common figures of speech that is used in literature and in due course of time with practice, you will be in a position to immediately identi identify or detect figures of speech very easily. Thank you for watching this episode, stay safe and goodbye.